Good morning. I'm Angela Crowley here on my platform, Neuroplasticity in Action, where I offer movement courses to help facilitate neuroplasticity, expanding human potential. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome Cynthia Allen, who has over 35 years experience, both as a practitioner, an educator, a manager, and an organiz organizer, who has brought the work to the public in the form of the Feldenkrais Summit, which has brought thousands and thousands of people. When I was a guest on your program, I think you had 28,000 people attend. And, and since then, what, what have your numbers been? They've been around 28,000 up to 30. Yeah, it's very, it's, very similar. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Absolutely. An amazing accomplishment. So you and I uh, share a passion of using movement to facilitate possibility. Mm -hmm. And you and I also share a passion in spreading the tools to do so via the platforms we've created. Mm -hmm. And it's quite amazing, really, that one approach to movement can help everyone improve and enjoy life better, from an Olympic athlete to an elder seeking ease in everyday movement, to someone in pain, to someone wanting to sleep better, to someone who just wants to learn a new hobby. So how in the world is it possible that one system can do all of that? Well, I mean, I love, first I want to say, Angela, I love the title of your podcast, Neuroplasticity in Action. And I think yeah. that it, to some degree, the answer is encapsulated in, in that title, because uh, when we understand, really understand neuroplasticity, we understand how something like the Feldenkrais method works. So, so somatic education, so programs like the, some, uh, the Feldenkrais method that you and I hold in common, uh, as well as then I do bones for life. And then there are other, other fields, right? Body, mind, centering and et cetera. That it, it's a beautiful field. And I really want to point this out because there's so many things coming out right now, calling themselves somatic workouts, somatic exercise, somatic this, somatic Thank that. You. And that is not actually what inspired it. What inspired it was the field of somatic education and now people are just taking just a little bit of soft language and attending to the body and adding it to other things. And that's actually not bad. It's wonderful, but it's not somatic education. Exactly. So, you know, it's not right. And so what is that special something is your question, right? The, in the Feldenkrais method that allows it to be so uh, av available to help people almost regardless of their challenge or hopes or dreams or activity level. And it really yeah. is centered in your title, neuroplasticity in action, because neuroplasticity is an active process. And the things that we do, we get better at doing, including really deep seated habits, compensatory habits sometimes, habits that came out of survival or trauma, habits that come with trying to protect ourselves from pain, habits that come from being a high-end athlete and trying to make something happen. And we often only think about the positive side of neuroplasticity, like probably when you were naming it, like most of us, me included when I use it, I'm thinking about the positive side of it. But neuroplasticity will wire in whatever it is you're doing that it identifies with your ability to, quote, survive. Including, for example, tension in the shoulders, holding our breath, um, walking with a limp that we happen to have learned decades ago from a sprained ankle that's led to back pain, et cetera. That's right. So... When we look at the Feldenkrais method, we look at it trying, although the word neuroplasticity didn't exist then, and I don't know if Moshe Feldenkrais would have something different to say about it if he were alive today than what I'm going to say, but I think what I'm saying is pretty on target The with his, would be his thinking, I'm guessing, of course, but 
the nervous system. So we've got this brain and this nervous central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, particularly the nervous system, the, the central nervous system is really monitoring our ability to survive. And it will always be asking this one question in this moment. It's only about survival in this moment, by the way. That's all it's asking itself. Am I okay now? Am I okay now? Am I okay now? It is not able to think about 20 minutes from now. It's not able to think about two hours or 20 years or 40 years from now. It only thinks about now. And it's looking at your respiration and your body temperature and what's comfortable, uncomfortable, and anything that strikes it as, right? Anything that makes the person hold their breath, go a little bit, it will, it will respond to immediately with a whole bunch of alarm systems and then some ratcheting down. So that's where that tension that you're talking about comes in because we have habits of how we deal with stress, right? Yes. I got mine. You got yours, right? Yes, that's for sure. That's for sure. Who doesn't, (laughs) right? Yeah. And so what the Feldenkrais method does is say, hey, let's help this person feel and feel and be incredibly safe at a level of safety that they have never, ever experienced before, perhaps. Maybe, maybe the last time they had it was in the womb and maybe not even then. And so we're taking the person to this deep level of safety, which means that the nervous system can open up, release the fear. Yes. Yeah. It can receive new messages. That's and right. And it can discern pleasure again. And it can discern joy and movement and efficiency And then as we build those new patterns of comfort, of joy, of efficiency into people, they carry on into their worlds. So it's not like a a quick fix or something that just ends at the end of a lesson. It grows in the brain. So, So those habits have grown over time through repetition. And by... And our our nervous systems can be trusted to take care of us, right? They're there to take care of us. So when providing a pleasurable, enjoyable sense of, of living, of breathing, of moving, we can trust our nervous system will want to embrace that, will recognize it, and will want to embody it further. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always say that the nervous system wants to upgrade. Yes. Presented with a chance to upgrade and function at a higher level, it will start to try to make that choice. Now, there is this other thing that has been grooved into the lightning fast patterns and habits of, you know, for me, 65 years. And so it's not usually, although it does happen sometimes, it's not usually that the change is permanent without any reinforcement. This is why awareness of what we do becomes so important. So I had a a series of Feldenkrais functional integration lessons last year with the fabulous Paul Rubin out of Mm. uh, San Francisco, and he helped me feel Uh, I don't know that this was his intention, but it might have been, but he helped me feel something that I do in my right shoulder blade for years, right shoulder Mm. blade, right scap, upper Mm. right side of my back. Mm. And I could then feel myself coming into it and going out of it and Mm. coming into it and going out of it. I could ask myself, I could go, oh, there's that thing I do. Ah, uh, there's there's the not thing. So, there's the letting so go. Of it. You begin to gain ownership of that, yeah. and then choice about that. Whereas otherwise, it was just happening subconsciously, really, perhaps sometimes annoying you. But or, and these sorts of things. You said something earlier about about our nervous system isn't thinking about the future. Neither is it thinking about which muscles to contract. Yeah. which is where it fits into to my profession as a movement exercise teacher. 
um, because it, we often approach training movement through thought, right? Do this, do that, contract this muscle, be in this form. And it's really from the outside in. And like you said, those patterns of organization from the commander in chief, our nervous system are happening at lightning speed. It's too late by the time the instruction has been heard or thought about, right? That's right. Because it, those, those patterns, like you said, they're at lightning speed, right? So in order to find new options, we need to get off the highway and slow down to where we're more like on, on a route of walking through a street where we can sense and see things and be aware of what's going on around us, but within ourselves, within our bodies, instead of just being on automatic fast track, right? Absolutely. In order to gain an experience, we need to slow down. And like you said, we need to create safety. <clears throat> we need to lighten the load on ourselves to be able to sense subtleties. Yes, it's just it's just so <laughs> important. So what happens inadvertently uh, in most approaches to a physical fitness, physical health, and I will also put most of rehab in this occupational therapy, Absolutely. physical therapy as well, because really physical therapy came out mm -hmm. of a fitness program way, way back when it, from Germany, you know, mm -hmm. it has its roots in fitness and, and often borrows things from yoga or Pilates, or th they kind of pull all these things in where yes. an emphasis <clears throat> is put on particular form, muscle, end range of movement. I, I want to talk about that with you. Um, so what happens is, as what you said, it's so fast that the person layers on muscular contraction. No, no, contract your quad right here. You contract your quad right here. They layer on muscular tr contraction on top of the yes. old bad habit. Yes. And when yes. you layer yes. on, on top of the old bad yes. habit, what do you get? more exactly exactly longer of the same thing yeah exactly that's right that's that's so well said so i have been privileged as an exercise instructor to be extremely successful around the world in both pilates and gyrotonic and in body work but i feel my success has a secret inside of it, which is the understanding I've learned through the Feldenkrais method. So that I'm really not intending to tell people what muscles to contract. I'm helping them have an experience where they are learning to sense themselves because none of us are the same. So how can we possibly give one instruction to a group of people to create an exercise or, or running, for example, or whatever the activity may be, when each person is completely different. I mean, each person learned to crawl, learned to walk in their own individual way. They have their own history of injuries, of habits, of patterns that have made them a completely uniquely wired, if you will, individual. And so, if I approach them all the same way, how can it work for anyone? It just, it, it, there's another way, which is to help each person sense themselves, provide that safe environment for them and create variation and let them learn their own best way, similar to how babies learn to walk through experimentation, right? So they have to, the babies have to experiment if they put their foot this way or that way, they tumble over until they find the line of force. Well, we can do the same thing teaching an exercise class, right? Put your, try this way with your foot, add variability to it, add varying patterns and trust that the nervous system in seeking its own well being for the person will find the best path for that individual. And because the individual has had the chance to discover it, they will own it. And 
it's so much more effective. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I think, you know, one of the challenges um, that I perceive is a, uh, as a participant sometimes in exercise classes, although I'll, I can talk about that a little bit, I find that most of them just aren't really safe for me. And but what I see is that, you know, you're, you've got a body of work to communicate in a group class. And so that body of work is what's going to take precedence. Whatever the body of work is, it's going to take precedence. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. how do you feel like you've been able to create a group and uh, experience that is more safe for, let's say, Pilates or for gyrotonics? Oh, I guess you don't do gyrotonics in groups that much, do no. you? We do sometimes, yeah, we do group sessions in the gyrotonic system. I prefer to focus on individualized sessions, but but <clears throat> the point is the same because I could teach according to an exercise curriculum or I could teach individuals. And it's that paradigm shift that I'm after sharing with others in the co educational courses I'm presenting. So... <clears throat> It's, it's instead of te teaching through instruction, it's inviting exploration. So I can take that same series of movements and just as we do when we're teaching Feldenkrais, I can have each person become aware of, <clears throat> of themselves, their contact with the machine, their contact with their foot, their breathing pattern. I can be talking about those things to an entire group and each person's experience will be different. And then within the curriculum of exercises, if I provide enough variability, each person will have a chance to find their best way. So if I let them first discover what they're doing instead of first correcting them. Like most people walk into a, a, all too often into a workout facility or a physical therapy facility and they learn what's wrong with them. And what I believe is that whatever they're doing is brilliant because it's helping them survive, right? So I embrace what they're doing and help them feel what they're doing. So before I even want them to do something different, I want them to feel what they're doing. So notice where you placed your foot. When you push on that part of your foot, feel what happens through your pelvis. Now go to a different part of your foot. Or if the shoulders are tense, for example, right? I can say relax your shoulders all day long, but no one's tightening their shoulders to spite themselves, you know? So they're tightening their shoulders for a reason. So, so it's like, okay, tighten your shoulders and feel what that does to your breathing. Or I can support the tight shoulders with cushions so that they can finally begin to let go so that I give them an environment that allows them to have another option. And they get to keep discovering more and more. So first I will have them exaggerate their pattern so they can feel what they're doing. It's kind of like on the map, if you're on a map to find where you're going, you have to know where you are. It's like where it says on the map, you are here now. It's like people need to know that in their body before they're going to go someplace else in their body. So it's, it's first helping them feel what they're doing, exaggerate even what they're doing because they've been doing it unconsciously, right? It's just become a habit, as you said. So f emphasizing, having them exaggerate the pattern that they do so they begin to recognize it in a safe environment. So that might mean that I use less tension or more support or put them in a different relationship with gravity so that they are safe. But first and foremost, <clears throat> we have to address if they're in that fight or flight mode, right? Because if someone it has so much pain that they're not going to be able to hear my suggestions of how they could move differently, right? It's like, first, we have to get them comfortable, right? And bring them, 
into an experience of comfort. So if someone's in pain, I'm not going to be pounding on them a new technique. No, I'm going to be helping them, their nervous system through tools such as breathing, using the eyes, using the mouth, using those parts of our nervous system that reach most deeply into the core of our nervous system to tell it it's okay. And once they begin to be able to relax, they begin to be able to hear me. And then it's my job to only accelerate my pace of giving them new information at the rate that they can stay relaxed and have a pleasant experience. Because if it's pleasant, their body's gonna embrace it. And it actually it sounds like a slower process, but it's much faster, actually. It's a much faster way to get there, curiously enough. Well, I want to back up to something that you said, which I think is just so key, is that you you're, are seeing the brilliance of what a person is doing habitually, not judging it, not saying, you, it might be that you look at it and you go, oh, that's not as efficient as if they were able to do this. But there's a difference between that and this kind of judging that goes on in a lot of the professions. It's yes. shame-based. It's actually like shame-based because then I have those people come to me, yoga teachers, Pilates teachers, weight trainers, and they're, they're ashamed, right, of what they are having they're struggling with. They're almost apologizing. They're, they're the apologizing, door. right, because right. they're are human. And th so this is, this is so, I mean, this is so important. And of course, I don't know what drove you to the Feldenkrais method, but for me, I was someone who had a lot of significant childhood movement, coordination issues, pain, trauma. And really I could not, I could not participate in normal, uh, physical education. And even as an adult, I would try, you know, I would try jazzercise at the time when that was a big thing, or I would try this, or I would try that. I would try physical therapy and I just always got hurt. And what I mean by getting hurt, I don't mean by something gets a little aggravated and then uh, it goes away in a day or two or a week. I'm talking about something happens that then takes me down for six months or a year. So I'm like, oh, this is so hard. This is just so difficult. And yet you had such good intention walking in the door. You do, and you so want it to work. I mean, you know, right. as a as a young woman, I so wanted it to work. And really, I so want that to work now when I go in a door. But I'm so cautious now because the fields just don't have the observation skills. They don't know really how to observe what you're talking about. They don't, they don't know how to take the time to listen, to bring people to that place of safety, and then how to chunk something down in a way that the person can take it in without injuring themselves. Um, and you cannot count, even on a Feldenkrais practitioner, you cannot count on a person who has a, a lot of vulnerabilities in their system, areas which don't stack as well, maybe go beyond in range movement easily, or somebody in pain often can't feel what's really happening because the pain messages are so strong. Yes. So what happens is that they're thinking, well, the person is going to tell me, they may have said, you know, tell me if something hurts. You're like, if you're lucky, they told you that. Just face it, if but you're lucky. some people aren't that in tune and they have never been invited to express it, even if they are. Right. They, so it's, that's an educational process in and of itself to help it is. people become in touch. And, and we, when have we been given permission to say, that's a little much for me or, 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 or we've been taught to try harder to succeed. Oh. Yes, but Angela, I would say, when do you, when would that practitioner ever say, well, they'd see what the person did? And then when, when would they ever say, let's do half that amount? Let's do one quarter that amount. Let's do one eighth that amount. Tell me in that range, which one feels the best yes. to you? 
Yes. Instead, the push is for more. It's for more. And when they push over, like that range in which, if it's an eighth, let's say, that feels really right. That's the, where the gold is, right? Really and gold. it's like, like, like the more familiar they get with that, the faster we're going to find a new route instead of those old habits that are damaging. But we need to embrace that little eight, <laughs> embrace that little eight and let them embrace it. And don't let them know that that's enough, that that's exactly where we want to be today. Be, I'm so happy that it feels good for you. This is exactly what I'm after. Like to have that encouraged, to have that celebrated instead of, well, that's good. Now go more. Always you know? ratcheting it up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, um, the Feldenkrais principle and the one we use also a lot in bones for life, which is to, you know, go small, go with what's easy. We don't go frequently. We don't go to the area that's injured, right? Exactly. We don't exactly. immediately, because we, why? Well, because we know it's a system. It's a, it's a biological breathing, changing cellular action happening system. Yes. So, I, one of um, my favorite teachers, uh, uh, Miriam from France, I remember her once saying that people are like cauliflowers. If you look at the whole cauliflower, it looks like a cauliflower. If you pull off one piece, it's still a cauliflower. So the nervous system is throughout the whole person. So you don't have to hammer at the place that has pain to create the change. You're actually better to go someplace else where they can feel some comfort, where mm -hmm. they feel safe, where it feels inviting, where they can become familiar again with comfort and then let that comfort attract more and more of themselves. And then pretty soon that pain is quieted down. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to, to, if you said, okay with you, that we just keep going here with I this, because I'm so excited. I love it. Yeah. So too. this, this thing of, of going to um, the maximum movement, you know, there's a couple things there. One is we're all trying to please our teachers, yes. the therapist, the person, yes. the doctor, whatever. We're trying to please them. I mean, we never really grow out of that. As far as I can tell, we want to grow out of it, but I think the nervous system knows, Hey, when there's a, somebody who's in authority, we should try to please them because authority people have a lot of power over us. So it's difficult to just really own that for yourself. So then it gets really tricky for the therapist, the, the instructor, uh, the trainer to really be okay with what looks like a snail's pace, mm -hmm. what, because every, because a lot of these setups, there's people everywhere doing all kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? Over there, my gosh, that guy has got that stroke patient already mm -hmm. up and walking, even though the person doesn't know how to move their pelvis at all. And then over there, that person over there, you know, they're, they look like they could return to the soccer field tomorrow. And over here, I'm just saying, hey, let's just stay with breath, mm -hmm. just stay with breath. So the therapist, the teacher has to really be okay with that. What looks like a snail's pace, but as you said, in the end it's, is actually faster and it's it, yeah. way more comprehensive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the results people are, are so thrilled because it not only solves their problem, like maybe they come in for a knee injury but their overall performance becomes better, becomes easier. They become faster. They become, they start having fun again, doing what they're doing. And they start having more fun in their life again. And they start feeling more creative again, instead of feeling like I am a hurt knee, you know, I mean, people become the identity of a problem sometimes for a good part of their lives. I have back pain. And they're almost, that's almost like their nameplate. I have back pain, you know? And so if we can get away from that and, and go, go 
go for the source, go inside the nervous system, because that's where, where the locks are held, right? Deep, deep inside, in those lower parts of the brain, those survival parts. And we have the skills to access those through, through our work, through things like, if you think about the like breath and movements of the eyes, the tongue, the mouth have been with us for millions of years, right? That's deep evolutionary knowledge that we can tap into to help someone tap into their own greatest intelligence because it's there, it's there that their nervous system knows a lot more than me. So how, how, can, how can I tell them when I'm not even inside their body, I don't know their history, you know, all I can do is invite them home within themselves and trust that if I do that, if I bring them the deepest core of themselves to a state that they feel comfortable again, they feel relaxed again, they can sleep again, that, that from there, the intelligence will begin to emerge to solve all of it. So when, in the beginning, I gave this big list of how can one movement system approach all these things. It's because the nervous system is underneath it all, right? The functioning of the nervous system and the new science of neuroplasticity just gives us lots of, of basis to show that, you know, and, and, Thankfully, the Feldenkrais work that we studied, Dr. Feldenkrais was a pioneer in my mind as a neuroplastician even and was practicing science just about 60 years ahead of its time. But but he understood he understood everything that we're talking about and gifted us with this understanding which we are both passionate of now sharing with other populations, which you do so broadly in, with your Feldenkrais Summit and with your Bones for Life program, and which I may mean to do in the areas that relate to my history since, since I've been a professional Pilates, gyrotonic instructor, body worker. And yet these same, these same, qualities, these same approaches, these same principles work for absolutely everybody because mm -hmm. we all have those same underlying um, elements of, of intelligence in ourselves that we can Absolutely. trust in our nervous system. And I don't know of any other technique that helps people to access that. Well, I, you know, I uh, agree with you. I mean, there's this, the, it's the quality of presence, right? It's, a, it's, it's this thing that we've become so enamored with in our culture in terms of following meditation, yoga, Buddhism, or whatever version of meditation of being present. But there is in the Feldenkrais work, a, a quality of being present within oh as an instructor, as a teacher, as a guide, as well as for yourself, that's really precious and is the, is the ground from which new things can really emerge, you know, and, and I think, um, it, it's such a fundamental education. I, when, like when I'm talking about bones for life, I, and people say, you know, well, do I need to give up being a Pilates teacher, a yoga teacher, whatever? If once I become a bones for life teacher and I'm like, absolutely not. Or someone will say, well, I, 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 I practice yoga. Can I still do yoga and, you know, and do bones for life? I'm coming to you because my back hurts, but will I have to stop doing yoga? And I always think, well, I don't know if you'll have to stop it. You might decide some things are not as good for you as other things, right? That's, that'll be the, the your decision to make your decision to it with a new reference. That's right. You'll have a new reference point, but they're not contradictory because Absolutely. this somatic education approach is the ground underneath for it's, which all it, movement emerges, so well all movement emerges from, because we're really just trying in somatic education to capture 
the childhood quality of exploration yes. that allows us to be interested without any idea of the outcome, just in the sensation, just mm -hmm. in the pressure, just in the ability mm -hmm. to suddenly lift an arm or to get our pelvis in the air and bounce it on the ground and be thrilled with the feeling of that. Mm -hmm. Um, all those things that children do, but we just can't really afford to do them while we're trying to learn all these other things in school and get ourselves established and, you know, all that stuff that goes on in order to be able to fit into this world. So we tend to have that pruned back by the culture. Yes. And I'm not sure that it's not necessary. I don't know. But I think that it is a very fundamental beneath the groundwork that if more people could have it as their ground for their field, then we would have so much more successful which, fields. Which is why I think you and I are both so passionate about getting it out there. Absolutely. Let's talk about why movement is used as the medium, because, you know, there, there are other ways of presence, like you said, like meditation, for example, and, and, movement is part of life is is the essence of life right without without movement there is no life yeah yeah so i mean i think the whole the whole thing starts with defining movement though because people are thinking that that means exercise exercise yes. is part of movement but movement is way more than exercise movement is yes. Blinking the eye, movement yes. is respiration. Movement is the cells bumping around and sending signals to each other. It movement is the ability to regulate your temperature in your body. Movement yes. is emotion. Yes. So it's it's absolutely you can't have life without it. You you can put somebody on a respirator uh, or an iron lung to keep them alive, and it will move for them. But if you take it away, they will not be able to, to survive because they can't move the most basic pieces for themselves. So it, it's, it's the ground of human being, as far as I can tell, you know, you, you just, you wouldn't have humans or any kind of organic being without it. Yes. And you mentioned emotion and I love the way you speak about emotion and the movement of emotion which you can certainly see in one's face, right? Mm -hmm. um, how if someone's happy, someone's sad, it's expressed through the, the muscles, it's expressed through the breathing, whether we're laughing or we're crying, all of, all of it changes altogether. And so how, why not use, for exa example, a talk therapy? instead to deal with emotions right and yet how many times do you hear people say oh it i can't find words enough to thank you you know because our words are more limited they come on so much later in our development whereas movement is far more primal in us where, where, like, it's very difficult to bring words to a sensation. I mean, we can try, we can try, um, but sensation has its own quality that cannot necessarily be defined through words that we can tap into through movement. And as people go into sensation, then they can become a, a, aware of, of the associations and movement that go with it. Yeah. And yes. Yes. I think it's, it's, um, it's, I think emotions, is, it's a big, it's a big piece. It's a big chunk. Okay. And, um, and of course, Feldenkrais said, look, at, you know, we are all of that. We are the physical, we are the emotional, we are the, the chemical, we are all of it, the spiritual, we're all of that. That's all, mm -hmm. it's all one cohesive being. It can't really be parsed out, but the fields of study and how we address it can be parsed out. So that's so important yes. to realize that we're parsing out the fields of study, but we're, right. but that doesn't mean we were successful in parsing out the person even though the surgeon goes and operates and replaces the hip joint, they are yes. affecting the whole person. So yes. 
when we look at emotion, I think that depending on what's going on in one's life and what kind of fertile ground or lack of fertile ground they had as a child for being a healthy human being, they're going to need more than one approach. And somatics is an, somatics, and I don't just mean somatic as it's being added onto therapy. I think that's great that somatics is being added onto psychotherapy. I do. But this piece of somatic education, where a person really learns to regulate themselves in a, in the process of movement is so vital. And why do I think that's vital? I think it's vital because physical movement is tied directly to survival. So when a person starts to do physical movement and they're being taught to attend at the same time Mm -hmm. to what happens when they bump up against a really strong habit or they bump up against Mm -hmm. using a part of themselves that they have never used or they bump up against using a part of themselves that has been hurt very badly. There is an emotional response to that. And if the person came from a really, really challenged background, somatic education will be overwhelming to them without a psychotherapist, a really qualified psychotherapist to be helping them. So it's so, I want to, I just want to say how important it is for me to say, I see the value in all these fields. Absolutely. And the surgeon. I'm kind of like dishing a little bit on some of them. Uh, Yes. I totally know these fields are very, very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think where we all work best is when we work as teams, like the more systems with which we approach, uh, uh, ourselves. For example, I got into this coming out of a car accident, having been a professional dancer and was fortunate that the naturopath who worked with me initially changed my diet, sent me to acupuncture, told me to meditate, sent me to an osteopath, sent me to Feldenkrais. He said, the more systems you are working with, the faster you're going to get better because they're all related. You know, so I, and I think, yeah, all these professionals are absolutely the physical therapists too, are, are, uh, thank, I mean, we have to be so thankful for all of them. We're just a part of the team, but what we offer is something else that I, is, is something that is more internal in, within the individual. Yeah, we do. We do. And I like to see where there were an injury, an illness, a, a psychological challenge is pretty significant. I like to see it as a triad. I like to see three group, three, three different people on that team for that person, if possible, um, because it rounds things out, right? It helps to yeah. fill in the gaps and the person gets more than enough support then. But there's so little understanding of something like Feldenkrais that oftentimes we're working at, we can be working at cross purposes by accident. So I know in Cincinnati, it's really difficult for me to find, and I'm sorry to say this for anybody in Cincinnati, you know, if you feel like I should be giving you a try and you're in any of these rehab fields, let me know, because I'm always looking for people to refer to. And it's difficult for me to find people to refer to that have had these more significant diagnoses. And they've usually come out of that system pretty disadvantaged. Um, So this is where you're, I just think, Angela, your work where you're really encouraging people who are in these fields to add to their repertoire is so, so important. And the work that I'm doing as training Bones for Life professional, giving CEUs or professional educators, becoming Bones for Life somatic education teachers is also important so that they can not not jump their practice. I want them to keep their physical therapy or whatever, but it will definitely help. Absolutely, it will. It's it's, it's, um, almost magical, the power of, of how it can combine with other practices. Can you speak a little more to us about Bones for Life and what that is? 
Yeah. So uh, Bones for Life was created by Ruthie Alon, and she was one of Moshe Feldenkrais's original um, 13 apprentices students. And so she was known in the Feldenkrais world for being this incredibly beautiful, flexible mover with this just beautiful, gorgeous eyes and very charismatic. And uh, she noticed that she was going into her 60s, that she was not, her posture was not what she thought it should be. She noticed that she was uh, always asking people to work with their shoulder blades. She got her own diagnosis of osteoporosis. She thought, what can, how can this be? I've been doing this work for all this time. I'm an incredible mover. I'm an incredible explorer. How could it be that that's true? And so she really wanted to take Moshe Feldenkrais's principles and his work and develop something that she felt would be more straight arrow towards this uprightness. She felt that Moshe had gone towards the therapeutic. She sometimes hypothesized it was because of that knee injury that he had, that he, you know, that ended up defining so much of his life because at the time those knee injuries didn't really have a lot of capacity to be treated successfully surgically. But, you know, as we know, he was able to move with that incredible yes. amount of, I mean, this is somebody who really could move despite the fact that his knee shouldn't have been able to allow him to, to really squat or do other things he could. He could. So he was able to use it to his advantage for sure, but she felt like it maybe Feldenkrais went a little too therapeutic, a little too much time on the floor. That was her idea. So she took a lot of, of his movement processes, his what he called, we call lessons in the Feldenkrais work. And she really streamlined them and created her own. And then she also put vertical pressure through almost all of them, really honing in on what she called, you know, wave or access wave being this pl place where your leg is swinging through the air. And there's just a little bit of exchange between the curves and access being when you come to stand in mid stance at the front of the heel and the curves all theoretically should become neutral a little bit more long so that you're really stacked on that weight bearing side. So she, she's just did a beautiful job of taking an, an unwieldy work. I will say the Feldenkrais work is unwieldy. You can never finish it. Right. I mean, <laughs> studying the rest of our lives. Yes. Right. And that's okay. I I'm totally Love in it. for studying the rest of our lives yes. with it, but she thought, look, people need something a little bit more bite-sized. She yes. they need things that they can do in five minutes. 10 minutes, mm -hmm. 20 minutes. They need something they can learn to memorize and still pay attention to the quality of the movement and the breath and um, what, how they're doing it, to learn how they're doing it, to experiment with other ways of doing it. And so she was very successful, I think, in coming up with that program. I the other love seeing the videos of her uh, teaching aspects of it. They're inspirational. Yeah, they're and absolutely. And you are a senior, a senior educator of Bones for Life. Senior trainer, that's correct. Yes. I'm a senior trainer, yes. yeah. And uh, uh, when is your next program coming up? Well, we actually have a little surprise one coming up very, very quickly. So if people were to uh, contact us at um, I think you're going to probably put that in the comments. If you don't want me to say it, that's fine. Oh, um, bo okay. Bones for yeah. us bones for us. We have a, a, a what starts as immersion one and people can come to it, even if they don't want to become teachers, but definitely that was my next question. Yeah. Can we everyday can take, people? Yes, absolutely. I would say the majority of people who start out with this at the beginning are doing it for everyday reasons. And then the people who go on to the more advanced study are the ones who are more usually from a professional background of some kind that wants to study deeper. And is so, that online or in person, Cynthia, with you? Almost everything is online with us. So yeah, oh, they can, they can do it. We get a, you know, and we have classes <clears> in four <throat> different time zones and they're live. We're not, we're not, 
interested so much in what people do on replays. I mean, we're glad that people use the replays, but we want to be with people. We keep small group sizes, for example, so that we can really attend to people and help people answer people's questions and, and walk them along. So yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. It's, it's wonderful. And I'll, I will say that I think that Signing up for a Feldenkrais training program, first of all, there's not that many around the world anyway. You have to travel a lot to be in person. It's usually going to take three to four years. It's a very large bite financially and time away from income. So I think anybody who can do it should do it. Absolutely. Like said, I have a bite-sized piece that's that's really that they can really utilize in their lives immediately. And it's fun. Yeah. Bones for Life is definitely something that they can start utilizing right away. And you can train in it as a professional in a much shorter time frame. It's the quality of the students that come out. is really high. Yeah. So, yes. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. We'll definitely be sending people your way. Yeah. And we're so excited about the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit, which we actually call it Move Better, Feel Better now, since you were on it. It's called the yes. Move Better, Feel Better Summit, because, you know, nobody knows the word Feldenkrais. So, and this year's theme is Awareness Heals. So we've got oh, Neil Thies, Dr. Neil Thies is going to be our keynote. What a fabulous, interesting person, pathologist, uh, part shaman, part author, part poet, part Anyway, he's going to be writing, he's going to be talking about complexity and, and where that inner world meets the outer world. And it's just what be I love fun. about your summit is that this valuable work that can help so many people that's hardly been heard of. Yeah. I mean, I tell so many people I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner and they vote your what, what, you know, You've taken that to thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world and people don't need any experience to come that, that pe everybody's welcome. That's and right. that is such a gift. I just want to personally say thank you. I don't know what inspired you. I know it was a lot of work, but it has done so much good and opened so many people's eyes. And I'm really grateful for you to you for doing that. Thank you, Angela. I'm, I'm just really grateful that the world has accepted it so well. And, you know, there's been so many surprises that have come out of uh, online teaching. I'm sure you've experienced this as well um, that I didn't expect. I never expected online teaching could be of the same quality that it could be with me in the room. And, uh, and in fact, it can. The qualities are sometimes a little bit different. But we see such great carryover mm. from people who are doing it in their own living rooms. They don't mm -hmm. associate it with the space that they're coming to. They associate it with their own living or room. Or like you said, or that teacher that they're trying to please, for example. Right, it right. also has that advantage. Yeah. It does. And then we also are now seeing, and we have seen from the beginning, but we're really trying to come on board with the last couple of years under because we're understanding more that, oh, people with disability are able to come to these classes that have never showed up in my private practice, never showed up in my group classes. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I get some people that are disabled, but mostly they stay home. They don't, they don't come to classes. They, don't, they can get in the building, get out of the parking lot. That's right. That's get right. Get on the floor. That's right. I have, for example, taken a participant in my last educational group who is legally blind and she would try to come see me as a practitioner and she would inevitably be 40 minutes late because it was so hard for her to get here and now I just work with her on zoom out of the comfort of her home and she doesn't have that stress right. to try and get to and from plus there's the expense of it too for people to travel to be away from home to negotiate well, sometimes they don't even have you know they don't have cars they're doing yeah. buses yeah i mean so the challenge really is very real opens the audience it really it, opens the audience and the fear of being seen we've also seen that that the fear of being seen is significant so we see people that leave their cameras off for weeks and then suddenly their camera is mm. on and you'll just see maybe their arm waving or their foot mm -hmm. waving. And then you see a little more of them the next week. And then you see a little more of them the next week. This is not accidental. This is somebody who's really coming home to themselves and accepting themselves and dropping that 
fear of judgment. So I'm really happy with what's been happening in the online world of movement for people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thrilled to be offering my course, um, which is neuroplasticity and exploration through movement online through neuroplasticity and action. And I had originally taught it in person directed toward Pilates instructors and, and, and people kept saying, I want more, I want more. And then here we are with the online world and the, the, evolution of neuroplasticity as a science and, and all this valuable information. So I've put together a course where it's in part educational about the science of neuroplasticity, because it's much easier to buy in if you understand the mechanisms and, and the logic of it. And then I take people into movement explorations, because how can they from the outside in know what I'm talking about. They need to have an experience of it. So we do a number of movement explorations in which they learn through their own experience what it feels like to approach movement in this way. And, and then I do examples of, of um, applications in various environments, such as in a Pilates environment for teachers to see how it can be applied. And um, I have people coming in from all walks of life, but Pilates instructors can get uh, 16 CECs. And what I've done now is I've spread it out. So the first time I taught it two days back to back, now it's it's five hours one Saturday, and then there are two weeks pass, then another Saturday, two weeks pass, and then another Saturday. So people can actually assimilate and integrate and experiment with the work, come back with real questions, and, so then, and then move forward. And they have unlimited access to the, the replay so they can do the things again and again. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled about it and, and can't wait to, to do more with it. Yeah, I, I just totally agree with you. I, I'm always looking at what more I can really do with the online medium and, uh, and, you know, it just, it keeps expanding. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy. And if people just want to have an experience, as you said, of the Feldenkrais work, they can show up for the Feldenkrais Summit and you can go to FeldenkraisSummit.com and get on the wait list. We'd love to have you. Super. Cynthia, it's such a pleasure to speak with you as always. Thank you Thank so much for Thank joining Thank you, Angela, me. for inviting me. And I just thrilled for all the things that you're doing. Thank you. You as well. Take care. You too.